UCLA basketball follows through on a threat to utilize the transfer portal. Bruins football reclaims a running back slash wide receiver who wanted to leave. And we'll break down why the Kings have all of Canada in an uproar. Good morning. I'm James. This is your daily dose of sports and snark for the greatest sports city in the world, Los Angeles. This is the Faithful Angelino's Morning Report. So it's April 4th, 2024. Wifey and I had date, light, date night last night and no, I did not wear my classiest Kings jersey for the occasion, but that's okay. It was a good night all around. Do you like being in the know about LA sports? Well, if you do, click the clack the like button. Click the clack the subscribe button. There's a notification bell, hit that. It'll let you know we drop new content. Sharing is caring, let people know we exist. And by all means, comment. Totally love hearing from you guys. Before we go through the news and notes, a look at the scoreboard. Terrific night for the Angelinos last night. Dodgers 5, Scum Francisco 4. They just paddled those little fannies one more time before sending them back north. Shohei Otani hits his first Dodgers home run. Tyler Glass now improves to 2-0. and Meanwhile, Anthony Davis scored 35 points, and the Lakers finished a road trip 5-1, and defeating Washington 125-120. And the Kings, Trevor Moore got his second career hat trick. They knock out Seattle 5-2. As for the Kings' current playoff chances, they have seven games to go. They have a five-point cushion on the first team below the playoff line. Seven games to go, five at home. Meanwhile, today, Denver's in town to play the Clippers at seven. Ty Lu said he's not sure if Kawhi Leonard will be able to play tonight. And the Kings are at San Jose at 7.30. And yes, that means the Kings, with two remaining road games, one of them is tonight. What do you say we get to the news? It may be premature to say that UCLA will rebuild its basketball team completely through the transfer portal. But Sky with two Ys, Sky Clark has decided to ditch Louisville for the Bruins. Clark was Louisville's leading scorer. He was a four-star recruit in the class of 2022. He also sinks more than a third of his three-point shots. All of which sounds pretty good, but here's the thing. UCLA is his third school. He started off his collegiate career. He played 13 games as a freshman with Illinois, transfers to Louisville last year, and was their starting point guard. Now he's coming here. It's, uh, if you look at his career, it is not so much Clark running to UCLA as much as it is fleeing the dumpster fire that Louisville basketball has become. Ten players have decided to jump ship from the Cardinals after they fired their coach. Now, as for how he fits with the Bruins, Sky Clark, well, I look up the depth chart, and it makes me wonder if Mick Cronin might be considering a small ball lineup. I'm not saying he will. I'm wondering because I thought they kind of liked both Dylan Matthews and Sebastian Mack. I thought so. <coughs> Andrews is probably keeping his lineup, his spot in the lineup. So another possibility then becomes maybe Cronin wants to choose between Mack and Clark. I could be wrong. We don't know. I can tell you from a very shallow look, it's almost as if Mack and Clark are the same player considering offense first, not as strong on the defensive end. Meanwhile, forward Elon Fibloil has entered the transfer portal. Now, in all candor, when Cronin was belly aching during the season about making multiple changes to the Bruins roster, he probably had this guy in mind. Fibloil, 6'6", UCLA desperately needed frontline help, but he only averaged a point a game. Here's what made him indicative of UCLA's problems all last year. He's French. Now, I'm not trying to suggest that Fib Loyal ran and hid from German players. That's not what I'm getting at. I'm saying that UCLA had way too many people 
speaking so many different languages that it was difficult for coaches to communicate what the hell they were trying to accomplish on the court, to actually educate instead of saying, run play X or something like that. Polly Pavilion last year literally became a Tower of Babel. Just saying. Meanwhile, elsewhere in Westwood, one of the minor questions about UCLA football going into spring practice was running back depth. Is there, for example, a primary backup? Now, Deshaun Foster dropped a big hint yesterday by once again correcting a Chip Kelly idea that simply didn't work out. Foster asked Kanan Jones to become a running back again. Kelly tried to switch Jones to wide receiver. That worked out so well that Jones wanted to enter the transfer portal. Foster, as we all recall, coached running backs under Kelly. And the reason that that mattered is he was constantly trying to convince Kelly to get Jones back into the running back room instead of wasting his talents at wide receiver. Foster told the LA Times, quote, that was my number one goal. Make sure I get Keegan back as a running back in this offense. His explosive plays to touch out touches is unmatched. Going into conference that we're going into, I don't know if they have a lot of guys with that type of speed, unquote. Now you might be asking yourself, didn't TJ Harden perform well as a feature back last year when spelling Carson Seal? But much like Foster did not commit to Ethan Garbers as a starting quarterback, there's no commitment to who starts at running back either. But the good news of that, despite this little bit of awkward roster chaos, you would have to acknowledge that the running back position just got a little deeper. Somebody's going to win the starting job, and theoretically, a pretty decent ball carrier gets to be the backup. Here is something that will shock you to your very core about UCLA football. Former Bruins offensive line coach Tim Drevno has landed a quality control gig under Chip Kelly at Ohio State. No, no, no. Who saw that coming? Chip Kelly handing out golden parachute make work contracts to his friends? No, Chip Kelly never did that couldn't possibly be. The Kings have been hearing all the complaints from opponents in Canada about how they play using a 1-3-1 uh, formation on defense. It's all the rage in Canada. And by rage, I mean that they're throwing cans of Molson at the TV whenever they see the Kings on TV because they say it's boring hockey. It's not even hockey. It's an abomination to the sport. Now, for their part, the Kings players are finding it kind of amusing because if you are a hockey historian just a couple of decades ago, the New Jersey Devils ran a similar system. They called it the left wing lock, the neutral zone trap. They won multiple Stanley Cups with it. And we talked about the 1-3-1 about a year or so ago. But since it has sparked a firestorm up north, and I really want to squash this controversy before Canada gets so upset that they have a syrup embargo on the United States, I thought we would go through it again. Opponents would love, absolutely love, to get momentum going through the neutral zone. Speed, get the defense on their heels, etc., etc. What the 131, as we diagrammed here on the board, the whiteboard of infinite knowledge, is that they, the Kings have decided to say, we're not going to let you get speed through the neutral zone because we're going to put an extra player in the neutral zone. They take a defender, move him up to the neutral zone to join a center and a forward. It literally has one forward in the opponent's defensive zone three in the neutral, and one more, one more defender basically anchored in front of the goalie. The idea is that instead of an opponent going straight ahead and getting a, a good head of steam going into the attacking zone, one of the forwards will kind of force that attacker to the side 
When that attacker gets forced to the side, he gets joined by the center and a defenseman. It's basically a three-on-one mismatch. Now, what do you have to do in order to counter that? Well, you either have to recognize a 1-3-1 one, one so quick that you dump the puck to somebody else and hopefully that poor bastard doesn't get trapped in the 1-3-1. One, one. Or you are forced to do something that is called in hockey the dump and chase, where you see those three people coming at you and you just blindly dump the puck into the far end of the ice, hoping that your teammates get to it first. But if you dump the puck too far deep, the goalie will skate behind the net, corral the puck, and the Kings have to get a chance at a uh, turning around on, on offense. Obviously, no system is perfect. There is a reason that the Edmonton Oilers have eliminated the Kings in the last two playoffs. That's because Connor McDavid and Leon Dry Dreisaitl are too fast and too skilled to fall into the trap. They basically are too fast. They just slide right through the 1-3-1 one, one before the three players can converge. The other problem with the 1-3-1 one, one is that the players have to commit. According to TV analyst Ray Ferraro, who played for the Kings back in the day, when he said he has seen the 1-3-1 one, one break down, it's because one of the players isn't is it joining in. The Kings, in fact, in my opinion, have such a player who has not committed to the 1-3-1. One, one. When I've seen the 1-3-1 one, one break down, it's far too often because I've seen center Pierre-Luc Dubois, who would be in the middle, not join in and create a three-on-one. Instead, the Kings have a two-on-one. It's easier for the opponent to pass out of it, and then the opponent gets speed through the neutral zone. The LA Daily News has reported that the top commit to USC basketball, Trent Perry, the California Player of the Year from last year, has reopened his recruitment because Andy Enfield is no longer the coach for the Trojans. The paper also reported sources who have claimed that Bronny James wants to go into the transfer portal as well. No. Sources told the LA Daily News that if James is going to leave USC, it's probably going to go to the NBA draft as opposed to the transfer portal. Finally, we were talking yesterday about Arkansas coach Eric Musselman coming to SoCal to get interviewed by the Trojans. If they do, in fact, go after Musselman, it's going to take a lot of this. Musselman is currently the 12th highest paid coach in the country at 4.26 mil. Yeah, he's a West Coast kind of guy, but he's obviously going to want to bump and pay. Straight and simple. The Dodgers admitted they will be using bullpen games a lot this season to give their starters more recovery time. The first bullpen game of the season, by the way, came Tuesday in a win over the Giants. With that, plus... Thursday's off day, four Dodger starters will get six days off between starts. Now, last year, the team started a pitcher on four days rest or fewer, 51 times. I'm not going to lie. I prefer a regular rotation. I'm a traditionalist. I don't like bullpen games. But, but, I understand why the Dodgers are doing it. They traded for Tyler Glasnow, who would be an ace, but he's only pitched more than 180 innings once in his career. Yoshinobu Yamamoto only pitched once a week in Japan. They didn't push him. Meanwhile, you're looking at James Paxton, Clayton Kershaw, all who have lengthy injury histories. Now, Kershaw, for his part, said he doesn't like going a uh, with bullpen games either. But he told the Times, quote, guys throw harder. It's more taxing. So I think we've kind of reached that point where if everybody throws hard, then maybe your arm just needs more time to recover, unquote. You might be asking yourself, how much of a difference does this make in the chase for a ring? 
Well, the Athletic went and they ranked every starting rotation in baseball. They placed the Dodgers fifth. Four of the top five, by the way, are in the National League. So that would be a problem, obviously, when the playoffs roll around. You're facing possibly Atlanta. You're facing possibly Philly. But the Dodgers just finished beating the holy hell out of the sixth best rotation in San Francisco. Here's the upshot. The Dodgers have to prove that they can stay healthy in order to be in the running for the best rotation in the game. But you already knew that. You already knew that. The only one that you could be assured of will be healthy is Bobby Miller. You knew that too. Jerry West will be inducted into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame for a third time. Three times. Once as a player, once as his, uh, for his work with USA Olympics, now as a team executive. And I gotta tell you, it's getting to the point where we should just forego all pretense and just rename the Hall of Fame after him. How many times are you gonna get inducted, right? I mean, if you really think about it, why is it the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame? What did James Naismith really do compared to Jerry West? I mean, any idiot could attach a basket to a wall and throw things at it, right? It wouldn't surprise me if in the Paleolithic era, Grog the Caveman got bored and just decided to put his rudimentary clay pot up there and just took aim at that pot with the skulls of his dead neighbors. How difficult really is it for James Naismith? What did he really accomplish compared to Jerry West? Now, by the way, as an executive, Jerry West won six rings with the Lakers. That's more than James Naismith. He also worked with the Clippers. No word yet, by the way, if West wants to come back as a referee so that he can get inducted into the Naismith Hall of Fame a fourth time. So to repeat, what did James Naismith really do compared to Jerry West? But you let me know what you think in the comments thread. Talk to me about the state of UCLA basketball, UCLA football, and if the 131 is really the devil's handiwork in the NHL. If you enjoy the content, don't forget to subscribe to Faithful Angelinos. We're talking LA sports every single day here. Thank you for watching. I'm James. We'll be back tomorrow. Faithful Angelinos is a Kian Corte El Queso production. Take care.